بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome back to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad in our previous episodes we spoke at length about the plight of the early Muslims specifically the the verbal and the physical assault that they faced at the hands of Quraysh and in our last session <clears throat> we spoke about the opposition tactics of the Quraysh we see that the first thing that they did when they realized that this new religious movement was going to be a problem it was going to disturb the the social norms they appealed to the chief of Quraysh. They, they appealed to the head of Bani Hashim, who was Abu Talib. When, when they felt that Abu Talib had ignored their concerns, they made a treacherous offer to him. They basically offered him another son in exchange for Muhammad They say that this is a young man that we offer to you that you can raise as your own son. And we give him to you under the condition that you surrender your nephew to us so we can finish him off. And of course, Abu Talib uh, declined that offer. The censoring of the Quran in public spaces. We mentioned that the followers of the Prophet, especially those who were not backed and were not affiliated with powerful tribes, individuals like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, when they would recite the Quran, in public spaces, they were assaulted, they were attacked. The Prophet ﷺ was mocked, his followers, the believers were mocked, they engaged in character assassination, they made uh, continuous demands for flashy miracles, not because they genuinely wanted to assess the veracity of the Prophet's words, but they just, they were inventing ways to challenge the Prophet and undermine him. They also uh, presented what they thought was a compromise where they essentially asked the Prophet that, okay, we'll worship Allah one year and then the next year you will worship the idols, that we will practice your religion, we will abide by the teachings of your faith for a period of time and then you also have to return the favor and you have to recognize the sanctity of our idols. And Allah Azza wa Jal of course reveals Surat Al-Kafirun as a response. And through their contacts with the Jews, especially in Medina, they collected uh, difficult questions in an attempt to stump the Prophet. And of course, in addition to all of that, we see the escalation of violence. Uh, when the Prophet ﷺ makes his da'wah public, especially as people are joining Islam, the, the physical torture, especially in the fourth year and the fifth year after the hijrah, uh, becomes uh, intolerable. So, <clears throat> we now come to the, the, the point in the seerah where plans are now being made for the Hijrah to Abyssinia. So for about four years, Rasulullah and his companions, his followers, barely survived the rising tide of persecution in Mecca. In our last episode, we spoke about uh, the torture that the that you know companions of the Prophet like Khabab experienced, you know, what what Bilal had to endure. And these were just you know, a few examples of the severe persecution that the early Muslims faced. Now in the fifth year after the Ba'tha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surat Az-Zumar, He hints at the possibility of emigrating from Mecca in search of religious asylum. In Surat Az Zumar, and this was before the uh, the emigration to Abyssinia. So again, there's 
It's almost a foreshadowing that we see in this verse. So in Surah 39, verse 10, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اتَّقُوا رَبَّكُمْ Say, O Muhammad, O my servants who have believed, fear your Lord, be conscious of your Lord. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا فِي هَذِهِ الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةٌ for those who do good in this world, there is good for them. وَأَرْضُ اللَّهِ وَاسِعَةٌ إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ And the earth of Allah, أَرْضُ الله, and the earth is spacious. Now here, some scholars have said that Allah, when He says وَأَرْضُ اللَّهِ وَاسِعَةٌ that the that the earth is expansive, it's spacious. They say this is a hint to the early Muslims that they need to start to think about emigrating to a place where they are free to practice uh, their faith. Now, the Prophet ﷺ was relatively safe in Mecca. He was not suffering the same physical abuse that the likes of Bilal and Khabbab and others were experiencing. Why? Because Rasulullah is the nephew of Abu Talib. And Abu Talib is the chief of the Hashemites. He's also seen as the chief of Quraysh. So because he has that layer of protection, and we know that in Arabia, your tribe is your insurance. Your tribe is your protection. So the pro so no one really dared to physically assault the Prophet. But of course, Rasulullah was not able to provide that safety and that protection to his followers because many of his followers were either non-Arab or they belong to, to tribes who you know, weren't considered to be powerful tribes, so they were vulnerable. So because the Prophet ﷺ could not afford them that protection, he advised those who were vulnerable, and even some who were not vulnerable, uh, and we'll speak about why the Prophet uh, insisted on certain individuals accompanying this first wave of emigrants. So the Prophet advises them to emigrate from Mecca to Al Habasha. And Al Habasha is Abyssinia. And the Prophet gives a reason. There are so many places that they could have emigrated to, but why Abyssinia? The Prophet, he says, go to Habasha, go to Abyssinia because there is a ruler there by the name of Najashi. And he says, Because in Abyssinia, there is a king. There is a king there before whom no one is wronged. And this, brothers and sisters, is really, you know, a great statement of praise. You know, I, I don't think that if you look at anyone who's ruling the world today who is in a position of power, I mean, how many people who are in a position of power can say with confidence that I have not done zulm to anyone? Here, the Prophet ﷺ is attesting to the fact that this man, who happens to be a non-Muslim, he says that this ruler, this king, and it's very rare for kings to be pious, to be righteous. Rasulullah says this king is one who does not wrong his subjects. So you see the Prophet ﷺ teaches us a very important lesson here. And that is that it is better to live in a non-Muslim land where the ruler is just 
and you have the freedom to practice your religion, it's better to live there than to live in Mecca, where you're mazloom, where you're oppressed and you're not able to practice your religion freely. So the priority, my dear brothers and sisters, and this is an important lesson that we learn here, is that we need to live in places where we're able to live in dignity. If we're able to, if we have that option, we should choose to live in places where we can practice our religion, where we have that religious freedom. So this is a, you know, a misconception that, you know, why should you live, you know, uh, and there are some people that say they criticize other Muslims for living in non-Muslim majority countries. Now, if, if those non-Muslim majority countries are affording you the religious freedom that allows you to practice your faith and the environment is not going to cause you to deviate and compromise your religious values, then by all means, live in a country that is non-Muslim. So the priority here is justice. The priority is religious freedom. What's the use of living in a Muslim majority country where you see the symbols of Islam, but there is no justice. There is nothing but sectarianism and religious persecution. So the Prophet says about Najashi, go, go to Abyssinia, إِنَّهُ مَلَكٌ لَا يُظْلَمُ عِنْدَهُ أَحَد Now, <clears throat> of course, when we, when we reflect on on Hijrah, we have to remember, brothers and sisters, that Hijrah, especially 14 centuries ago, and in this context, it was very difficult. We should not underestimate the struggles and the hardships that go along with Hijrah. You know, today, you know, even when we want to move and relocate today, in 2021, it has its challenges. But, at, but in this period... 14 centuries ago in Mecca, number one, it was a great financial risk for the early Muslims to emigrate. Why? In progress. Why is that? Because, number one, even those who are wealthy, you know, we don't have any bank transfers that can be done. So even those who are wealthy and who have gold and silver, they can't take their gold and silver with them because it's dangerous, number one, to carry that much wealth because you could be looted. Secondly, they can't sell. You know, Even if someone is wealthy in Mecca and they want to go on hijrah, it's not, that they can, it's not like they can sell everything because they want to escape secretly. They want to emigrate secretly. If they start selling their, their property, they're going to alert the heads of Quraysh. So, so, this, so, there are, so you have that financial risk that you have to consider. Secondly, secondly, what we find is that they're also going and they're emigrating to a land that they're not very familiar with. Yes, they may have had trading relations with Abyssinia, but they've never lived there. The people who live there, most likely they don't speak Arabic. When they move to Abyssinia, they no longer have the protection of their tribes. So Hijrah, brothers and sisters, is a, it's a, it's a huge difficulty. It carries a lot of trials and tribulations. You have the, the financial vulnerability, the vulnerability of not having the protection of a tribe. But yet, and, and this, all, this shows you how difficult it was for the Muslims in Mecca. That Mecca was so unbearable that they are willing to emigrate to Abyssinia and experience and endure all of these hardships because of how awful it was for them in Mecca. Now, we come to the, the first emigration to Abyssinia, the first hijrah 
to Abyssinia because there were two hij hijras to Abyssinia. In Rajab, in the month of Rajab, five years after the Ba'tha, the historical accounts don't give us an exact number, but 11 to 13 or even 14 men and four women fled Mecca. So you have less than 20 companions, male and female, who fled Mecca and they headed for the port city of Ash-Shu'ayba. The Prophet ﷺ, he appoints a leader, a leader for these emigrants. And the leader was Uthman ibn Mad'oon. Uthman ibn Mad'oon was a very righteous companion of the Prophet. And, you know, by the way, people often say, and, you know, just as a, uh, a side uh, remark, many people, when they read about the names of the sons of Amir al Mu'mineen, they say, oh, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib named one of his sons Uthman, and th therefore, you know, this is proof that he, he had a good relationship with the third Khalifa, that he loved Uthman ibn Affan. Number one, who says that Ali named his son Uthman after Uthman ibn Affan? Why, why not Uthman ibn Mad'oon? And this is what we ha have in our traditions. So this is uh, an assumption that some people make that because Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib named his son Uthman, it means that this is an indication that he had a good relationship and he thought highly of Uthman ibn Affan. Imam Amir al muminin named his son Uthman after Uthman ibn Mad'oon, this great Sahabi of the Prophet. So that's just uh, a side note. So the leader of this initial group that went to Habasha was led by Uthman ibn Mad'oon and he was accompanied by a number of uh, notable individuals. And I say notable because they're very well known in the history of Islam. Uthman ibn Affan. And Uthman ibn Affan, of course, he later becomes uh, the third Khalifa. And Uthman ibn Affan is from the Umayyad tribe. He's an Umayyad and he's wealthy. And it seems that the Prophet ﷺ sent Uthman ibn Affan because he wanted to have some Muslims in Habasha who had financial resources. Because you don't only want to send a group who are completely financially disadvantaged. So the Prophet wanted to ensure that you know, they can build a community. And in order to do that, you need uh, to have certain people who have uh, deeper pockets. As Zubair ibn al-Awwam. Zubair was among the, those who went on that first uh, hijra to Habasha. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf. Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, this name, he's a companion of the Prophet, and he was in that council of six individuals that was uh, appointed by Umar ibn al Khattab, and he becomes the arbiter, the one who decides who the third Khalifa will be after this, the votes are split. And then you have Abu Salama and Umm Salama. Now, Umm Salama, of course, you know, after Abu Salama dies, she becomes a widow, and then the Prophet ﷺ marries Umm Salama. So this is the Umm Salama that eventually later on becomes the wife of the Prophet. So you see, Umm Salama was among the, the early Muslims. She was a very devout lady, and after her husband passed away in Habasha, she was a widow, and the Prophet ﷺ uh, married her. So these, this group, they decide to flee Mecca. Shu'ayba is a port city. When they arrive there, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there were two merchant boats, and they agreed to take them to Abyssinia. And... By ship, it takes about a day and a half to, from Shu'ayba to Abyssinia. So it's about a day and a half, which is not too far. 
And they do it for half of a dinar, which is a pretty, uh, a very reasonable uh, price that they uh, charged. Now, and they did this without the knowledge. They were able to escape without attracting the attention of the pagans. Now, by the time Quraysh reached Shu'ayba, you know, they must have received some, some news that some of the Prophet's followers are, were fleeing. When they arrived, they saw that there was no one there, you know, because they were long gone by then. What's interesting is that what we find in the historical reports is that after a few months, the Muslims in Abyssinia, Uthman ibn Mad'un, Zubair, Mus'ab ibn Umair, and the others, they heard a rumor that the pagans, the mushrikeen of Quraysh, had all accepted Islam. Imagine, they're in Abyssinia, they've emigrated, they've left their homeland, and they receive news that the leaders of Quraysh, that Abu Sufyan, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, you know, <clears throat> all of the, you know, Al Mughira, Al Walid ibn Al Mughira, all of these individuals, they became Muslim. They submitted to Islam. So when they hear this, they think to themselves, there's no reason for us to stay in Habasha. So they returned. They returned to Mecca. But as we know, brothers and sisters, many of the things that we hear are not true. You know, this is why Imam Al Hassan Al Mujtaba, salawatullahi alayhi, he says, in a narration that's attributed to him, he says, the difference between haq and batil, between truth and falsehood, is four fingers. And he illustrates it by placing these four fingers between the eye and the ear. You know, the distance between the eye and the ear is about four, four fingers. And the imam says, most of what you hear is batil, and most of what you see is haq. And this is an example of something that was heard, it was a rumor that was false. Now when the Muslims returned, when this group of emigrants, when they returned to Mecca, as you can imagine, they were tormented and tortured even more severely than before. Why? Because they left. You know, the Quraysh considered them to be treacherous. So this was the first group that went on Hijrah to Abyssinia. There was a second group that went. And the second group was larger. A second group of about 70 to 80 individuals, they departed Mecca under the leadership of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the brother of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, the older brother of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. And among those who joined, who joined Ja'far, there were a number of them, you know, 70, 80, we're not going to list all of them, but some of the prominent individuals who accompanied him, of course, his wife, Asma bint Umais. Asma bint Umais was the wife of Ja'far. And after the martyrdom of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib in the Battle of Mu'ta, and we'll speak about this inshallah in our coming episodes, Asma then marries Abu Bakr. And what's interesting is that when Fadak was confiscated, when Abu Bakr confiscated Fadak from Fatima al Zahra, one of the witnesses that came forward to testify that Fadak belonged to Fatima and it was given to her during the lifetime of Rasulullah, one of the witnesses was Abu Bakr's wife, Asma bit Umais. But her testimony was dismissed because he felt that she was biased towards Bani Hashim because she was previously married to Ja'far. Ibn Abdul Muttalib, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. So Asma, of course, was with her husband Ja'far. Um Habiba, Um Habiba bint Abi Sufyan. So Um Habiba 
was the daughter of Abu Sufyan, she became Muslim. And not only did she become Muslim, the, the Prophet ﷺ, he ends up marrying uh, Um Habiba. And then you have uh, Al-Maqdad ibn al-Aswad. Al-Maqdad is probably one of the greatest companions of the Prophet and one of the most loyal companions to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. He is one of the few who did not waver after the death of the Prophet This is Al-Maqdad. He was among those who went on the, the Hijrah to Habasha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nahl, ayah number 41 to 42, Allah praises these Muhajireen. The Muhajireen, those, especially those who went to Abyssinia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا فِي اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا ظُلِمُوا Those who emigrate for the sake of God. You know, there's a difference between emigrating because of employment opportunities, emigrating, you know, because of fear. These are people who emigrated for the sake of Allah. They put themselves through difficulties to preserve their deen. وَالَّذِينَ هَاجَرُوا فِي اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا ظُلِمُوا لَنُبَوِّئَنَّهُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَةً وَلَأَجْرُ الْآخِرَةِ أَكْبَرُ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ Those who emigrate for the sake of God after they have been wronged, we shall settle them in a good place in this world. So Allah says that I will bless you in this world. I will provide for you in this world and their reward in the hereafter is even greater. Those who persevere, who have sabr, who have patience and trust in their Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He praises uh, these individuals. Now, why did the early Muslims emigrate? As we've already mentioned, one of the main reasons why they emigrated is, is to escape the torture, the unbearable torment at the hands of the pagans. As we mentioned, brothers and sisters, you know, Abu Jahl, you know, Abu Jahl, day in and day out, he would torture the Muslims. So for many of them, it was just a matter of survival. You know, the reason why they emigrated is because they couldn't survive under these conditions. You know, you have the likes of uh, Sumayya and Yasser. You know, they, the early Muslims saw that, you know, these kuffar, these mushrikeen are willing to go so far as to kill Muslims simply because of their beliefs. So why did the early Muslims emigrate? Number one, to escape the unbearable, unbearable torment of the pagans. Number two, to diffuse the tensions between the Muslims and pagans in Mecca. You know, those who are vulnerable, Rasulullah wanted to remove them, send them away, because as long as they are present, there will be clashes between the Muslims and the pagans. And the Prophet ﷺ wanted to diffuse the tensions. And number three, and this shows you how, how much foresight the Prophet ﷺ had. The third reason, and again these are just some of the main reasons, to have a backup plan in case the Muslims in Mecca and then even in Medina were wiped out. The Prophet needed a, a contingency plan. If God forbid the Muslims in Mecca and in Medina are wiped out, that, that means Islam will be, will be eradicated. So the Prophet wanted to plant the seeds of Islam in another area as a backup plan, where if God forbid the Muslims are eradicated in Mecca and Medina, there is still a Muslim community in Abyssinia that can flourish. So this idea of not putting all of your eggs in one basket. And again, these are important 
lessons on uh, community building. Now, the Arabian Peninsula is a huge place. There are many regions, many neighboring territories. Why did Rasulullah choose Habasha? Why did he choose Abyssinia as a refuge for his followers? Number one, Habasha was known to the Arabs. As we mentioned, when the first wave of emigrants, when they traveled to Abyssinia from one of the port cities, it was only a day and a half by sea, which is relatively close. And because of their close proximity to Abyssinia, it was a trading route for them. It was a trading destination for them. So the Arabs were familiar with Abyssinia. You know, so even though it was a foreign land, there was some familiarity with its people and with that region. Number two, and most importantly really, is that Najashi was known to be a just ruler. The Prophet ﷺ very clearly informed his followers that I want you to go specifically to Abyssinia because this is a man who does not wrong his subjects. And, of course, they were confident. And because he was fair, because he was just, they were confident that he would not force them to return to Mecca. Now, <clears throat> after Quraysh realized that some of the Prophet's followers had emigrated to Abyssinia, they immediately dispatched two mercenaries led by Amr ibn al-As. And Amr ibn al-As, many of you know this individual, the infamous Amr ibn al-As, who was one of the arch enemies of the Prophet. And this man becomes the senior advisor and the right-hand man of the right-hand man of Muawiyah. You know, and this shows us, brothers and sisters, that many of these individuals, they, they formally, they outwardly joined Islam. If you look at their behavior and the way that they conducted themselves, it was very clear that these individuals, they submitted with their tongues, but they continued to wage a war and they continued to cause a lot of damage to Islam and the Muslim community even after their uh, supposed conversion. <clears throat> so these two men, these mercenaries, when they arrive in Abyssinia, they bribe some of Najashi's generals. Even before reaching Najashi, they thought that you know if we bribe them, we can win their hearts over and they'll cooperate with us. They'll send us back these runaways. So this was their plan, that we're going to bribe, we'll shower them with gifts, and they'll send back these, these fugitives. But Najashi, being a man of integrity, he vowed that he would continue to protect them as long as they sought his protection. Now, Najashi, when he hears that, you know, the Quraysh, the Meccans, they want these runaways back, they want to, you know, we can say extradite them back to Quraysh. Najashi, being a sensible man, he summons the Muslim emigrants so he can hear their case. On the one hand, you have Amr ibn al-As and these two mercenaries saying that these are runaways and these are troublemakers. We want them to be extradited. We want them to be sent back. Najashi says, I want to hear both sides of the story. Um Salama, again, she was, she was in Abyssinia. She describes their arrival, the arrival of the early Muslims in Abyssinia. She says, and I'll read to you, you know, verbatim what she shares, because I think it, it, reading this narration really captures the, uh, the atmosphere and the, the sentiment of, that, uh, of these, uh, this interaction. She says, when we arrived, 
meaning when we arrived in Abyssinia, we sought refuge with an Najashi. Just as the Prophet ﷺ had instructed them, and he granted full amnesty for us to practice our religion and to be safe from all harm. The Quraysh sent two men to convince Najashi to send us back. They brought many fine leather skins as gifts. You know, they tried to bribe them. First, they approached each of the bishops in his court and gave him his gift. So one by one, imagine, you know, they're giving gifts to all of these bishops and asked him to speak in their favor in court. So literally bribing them so that when Najashi holds uh, this hearing, that they will rule in their favor. So they bribe all of the bishops. Um Salama then says, Then they approached an Najashi. They gave him gifts. And they asked him to return the Muslims to their people. Meaning return them back to Mecca. They said, Who said? The, the mercenaries, led by Amr ibn al-As. They said, some foolish young men and women of our people have taken refuge in this kingdom. They have left their own religion, not for your religion, meaning that they're not Christians. It's not that they joined your religion. They abandoned their own religion, not for yours, but for one they have invented, one that is unknown to us and unknown to you. And the nobles of their people, meaning the elites of Quraysh, the Abu Sufyans, the Abu Jahls, the Walids, they've sent us to you on their account that they may return them to us. The bishops who were bribed supported them. Um Salama says they supported them and they said, these two men, they've spoken well. Their people know what to do with them, so we should turn them over. This is a conflict between these Arabs. Why should we get involved? Send them back to their people and they'll resolve their own conflicts and disputes. Najashi, and this is where you see the, the integrity of this man. Um Salama says, but an Najashi became angry and said, No, by God they shall not be betrayed a people that have sought my protection and made my country their abode and chosen me above all others. They could have went anywhere, but they had confidence in me. Give them up, I will not, until I have summoned them and questioned them concerning what these men say of them. You know, these mercenaries, they're making some claims, they're making accusations. I have to hear both sides of the story. If it be as they have said, then I will deliver them that they may restore them to their own people. But if not, if it turns out that these are false accusations, then I shall be their good protector so long as they seek my protection. Now Najashi wants to hear from the Muslims. And you know this is not a mistake that Rasulullah sends Someone like Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. If you look at the way that Ja'far ibn Abi Talib interacts with Najashi, you understand that this is a man of wisdom. It's a man of eloquence. And by the way, brothers and sisters, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib is in his early 20s. He's in his early 20s when he's in Abyssinia speaking to Najashi. Look at how Rasulullah develops leaders. You know, if you want to know how great Rasulullah is, Look at how great some of his followers are, like Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. How wise, how articulate, how intelligent. And Najashi sent for Ja'far and the other Muslims and narrated the complaints of the Quraysh's emissaries and their request to have the Muslims return to their people. And now Ja'far speaks. Ja'far said, Great king, ask them, if we are their slaves who have run away, they want us to be returned. Ask them, are we their slaves 
who have run away from them, so they have a right to ask that we be returned? Amr replied, No, they are, they are free men. Ja'far then says, Ask them if we owe them some debts that they now wish to claim. Are we in debt to these people and that's why they're chasing after us because we owe them money? Amr said, No. They owe us nothing. Ja'far says, Ask them if we have killed someone among them wrongfully that they now seek retribution. Amr said, No. So Ja'far, Alayhi salam, he says, Then what do you want from us? You tortured us, so we left your city. So that's, that's essentially the story. We're not your slaves. We don't owe you money. We didn't kill anyone, so you're, you're chasing us to seek retribution. What happened is that you tortured us for our faith, and we left. Amr, Amr ibn al-As, he addressed an najashi and said, Great king, these people oppose our religion, meaning the pagan religion. They revile our gods, they corrupt our youth. Of course, this is a lie. How, how did the Prophet corrupt their youth? And cause upheaval in our society. They cause fitna, so send them with us so we can finish this affair. And this is where Ja'far says, he gives his speech now. Ja'far, he looks at Najashi and he said, O king, we were a people steeped in ignorance. We were drowning in ignorance, worshipping idols, eating unsacrificed meat, dead meat, committing abominations. The strong would devour the weak. This was, this was Arabia before Islam. This was the pre-Islamic era. Thus we were until God sent us a messenger from out of our midst. One whose lineage we knew and his veracity and his worthiness of trust and his integrity. They were the ones who called Rasulullah Sadiq al Amin. He, meaning the Prophet, called us unto God that we should testify to His oneness and worship Him and renounce the stones and idols we and our fathers had worshipped. And He commanded us to speak the truth, to fulfill our promises, to respect the ties of kinship and the rights of our neighbors to refrain from crimes and from bloodshed. So we worship God alone. We don't ascribe any partners to Him. We consider illicit whatever He has forbidden, meaning whatever God has forbidden, and permissible whatever He has allowed. For these reasons, our people have turned against us and have persecuted us to make us forsake our religion and revert from the worship of God to the worship of idols. This is why we have come to your country, having chosen you above all others, and have been happy in your protection. And it is our hope, O King, that here with you we shall not suffer wrong. Najashi then says, and I'm sure those of you who've seen the movie, uh, the Messenger, you prob the message, you probably remember this, you know, this iconic scene. Najashi asked Ja'far, "Do you have anything that your prophet has brought from God? You say Muhammad is a messenger of God. Is there a message from God? Do you have scripture revelation to recite?" Ja'far said that he did. Yes, we have something from God. And he begins reciting Surah Maryam. And I'll just read the English translation of what he recited. Mention in this book the story of Mary when she withdrew from her family to a place in the East. And you know, this is these ayat Jafar is reciting from memory, from the heart. And the bishops and Najashi, they're all listening. Mention in this book the story of Mary, 
when she withdrew from her family to a place in the east. Then she concealed herself from them, whereupon we sent to her our spirit, and he appeared before her as a well-proportioned man. She exclaimed, I seek protection with the all-beneficent from you, so stay away from me if you truly fear God. He said, I am but a messenger from your Lord, whom he has sent, that I may give you a pure son. She said, how can I possibly have a son, since no man has touched me in wedlock, and I have never been unchaste? He said, nonetheless, the matter is, as I have said, your Lord says, such a thing is easy for me. We shall do this for various reasons and so that we may make it a sign for humankind to know our power and a source of mercy from us, that they may know their prophet and be guided by him. It is a matter already decided. Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he recites these ayat. And the narration, brothers and sisters, says that Najashi began to cry. Not just a teardrop. His beard became soaked with his tears. He was weeping. And the bishops also began to cry. And he said, Najashi says, after hearing a few ayat of Qur'an, you see, brothers and sisters, when Qur'an is recited to a heart that, is, that has the fitrah, to a heart that is not blackened with rebelliousness and arrogance, it moves the heart. This is the word of Allah. This is the word of the creator of human beings. Najashi said, this and what Jesus said are two rays from a single lamp. It's like two beams of nur coming from the same light source. Then he turned to Amr and his companion and said, leave. I shall not hand them over to you. That's it. Case is closed. The next day, look at the determination of Amr, Amr, Amr ibn al-As. The next day, Amr returned to Najashi and told him that the Muslims insult Jesus by calling him a slave. So Najashi, he summoned Ja'far again and asked him, what does your prophet say about Jesus? And Ja'far, he says, we say about him what our Prophet has told us, that he is a servant of God, he's a messenger, he's a Rasul, and a spirit created by him, he's Ruhullah, and his word, Kalimatullah, which he cast into the Virgin Mary. Upon hearing this, Najash, he knelt down, and he pounded the earth, he picked up his splinter, and a splinter of wood, and said, Jesus, son of Mary, did not surpass what you have described more than this splinter's weight. And then he addressed the Muslims and said to them, Go freely. Anyone who derides you shall pay. I would not take even a mountain of gold to see one of you harmed. I want to make one comment, brothers and sisters. When we Muslims live in a non-Muslim land, and that country and that region has provided us with religious freedom, and we are able to live a dignified life, we need to be law-abiding citizens. The Muslims in Abyssinia did not try to overthrow the government and establish an Islamic government in in Abyssinia, they recognize that we are a religious minority. The majority are non-Muslim. They have they've afforded us religious freedoms, and we will be good citizens. We will be we will be loyal to our country. We will not betray this country. We will work for the betterment of this country. And because they did that, and because they truly lived Islam, you see that the non-Muslim ruler loved those Muslims so much so that he says that I would not give, I would not take even a mountain of gold to see one of you harmed. You know, when we as Muslims, when we live 
in our communities, this is the impression that we should leave in the minds of non-Muslims, where we are such positive contributors to our communities, whereby non-Muslims fight to keep us here because of our goodness, because of our integrity, because of our compassion, our morality, because of our sense of justice, where they feel that the community is better because of our presence. This is what this is the impression that the Muslims left on Najashi and the Christians of Abyssinia. And I'll conclude here where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually praises these devout Christians whose hearts were softened when they listened and when they heard the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ma'idah verse 82, He says, وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَى ذَلِكَ, ذلك بِأَنَّ مِنْهُمْ قِسِّيسِينَ وَرُهْبَانًا وَأَنَّهُمْ لَا يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ Allah says, you will find those with the most love for the believers to be those who say we are Christians. That is because among them there are bishops and monks and because they are not arrogant. وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا The next ayah. وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفْتَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ When they hear what is revealed to the messenger, you see their eyes well up with tears because of the truth that they knew. They said, Lord, we hereby believe, so record our names with those who have testified. And by the way, brothers and sisters, Najashi, as we'll, and we'll talk about this more in our next episode, Najashi ends up becoming Muslim. He becomes Muslim. And I think credit goes to, of course, the Prophet and, and individuals like Jafar ibn Abi Talib. Have you ever seen a refugee someone seeking religious asylum in a country where the majority of the population follows another faith and you convert the ruler of that country to your religion because of, because of the way that you carry yourself. This was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. This is, these are the types of people that the Prophet ﷺ raised. Inshallah, in our next episode, we'll speak a little bit about, about, a little more about uh, the Muslims in Abyssinia and uh, about the Najashi's conversion to Islam. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. Uh, please join me in uh, the upcoming episodes of The Life of Prophet Muhammad. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al Any questions or comments? Zayn, today I only have about five minutes. I have uh, uh, an appointment uh, coming soon. So I only have five minutes, but inshallah next week we'll be able to allot some more time. Sure, inshallah. Um, but so first question. Yes. Uh, is Zubair from the first, uh, first migration the same as uh, Talha and Zubair? Uh, the Zubair that, that we mentioned uh, in the first immigration, is he the same Zubair that fights yes. Imam? Yeah, he's the same Zubair. Zubair ibn al-Awwam is, uh, yeah, he's the same Zubair. And uh, why was it that uh, getting the Muslims back was so important to the pagans? Because <clears throat> they, they knew that if, if they allowed the Muslims to just emigrate and settle, that the Muslim population would, con would continue to grow and they would be strengthened. So they wanted to have them all concentrated in Mecca because they wanted to contain the problem. You know, to them, Islam is a virus. You don't want this virus to spread to any of the neighboring uh, regions. Uh, and this is why the this is why the Mecca, the Quraysh continued to uh, chase and harass the Muslims even after they uh, went on Hijrah to Medina. You would think that okay, now they're in Medina and they're out of Mecca, you know, because they knew that. This movement, 
is going to continue to grow and perhaps they might come and overthrow us. So they were very wary, they were very worried about uh, this religious community growing and becoming viable and uh, becoming strengthened over time and then they would become a formidable force. So they wanted to keep them contained in Mecca so they could uh, obliterate them essentially. And th- th- this one's a little bit more theoretical, but why didn't the Prophet move to Abyssinia since it seemed to be so welcoming to Muslims? Why didn't the Prophet go to Abyssinia? You know, of course the Prophet ﷺ, what he does is under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's direction. You know, If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted him to go and settle in uh, in Abyssinia, then he would have went. But the Prophet knew his his taklif, and the Prophet was sent to this region. And you know, it's important for Mecca, which is the symbol of Tawheed, which is the house that was uh, raised up by Ibrahim. It's important that this region is rescued from its state of polytheism. Because if because Mecca is, you know, is it's, it's a very important it's it's the, the the site of religious pilgrimage. It's considered the the epicenter of Arabia, and if and in in order for Islam to really spread, that epicenter has to be conquered. So if the Prophet leaves Abyssinia, uh, who knows if that would have happened? So the Prophet has to kind of go through. Uh, you know these periods of struggle and confrontation to eventually uh, uh, basically purify uh, Mecca from uh, from polytheism. And Allah knows best, of course. Why didn't the Prophet go to Abyssinia? The Prophet, the Prophet knew what his duty was. He's guided by revelation, and he did what uh, what he needed to do uh, because he operates. Uh, by uh, divine uh, revelation. Now, uh, continue the line of these uh, theoretical questions. Yes. Uh, and uh, so, one of the reasons given for um, why the early Muslims emigrated was that to have a backup plan in case Muslims and in, in the Mecca and Medina were wiped out. So, does that mean that? Uh, like, is that talking about the Prophet himself also having been killed? And so was he not maybe the last Prophet, like declared the last Prophet at that point in time? Of course, when, when, when the Prophet makes decisions, he's not going to make decisions based on... He's going he's gonna to make decisions based on the facts that are on the ground. You know, because at the same time, the Prophet is also a, a role model for other leaders. And the idea here is that that when you when you plan anything, you need to have backup plans, you know. And this is this is what this is what makes a good leader. That we shouldn't be naive. That you need to have a contingency plan, you know. The Prophet sallallahu you know, Allah could have supported the Prophet with with angels without having any need for any military preparations. But the Prophet prepares and he makes the necessary. Um, Arrangements based on the, the natural means, the na- the information that's available to him on the ground. So, <coughs> it's not to say that the Prophet would have been killed, but if a sizable number of the Prophet's companions were were killed, at least the Prophet would have had some uh, some uh, followers in Abyssinia. So it doesn't mean that the Prophet did this because just in case he's killed, the uh, the Prophet, you know, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is going to preserve the messenger until the message is delivered because he's the final messenger of God. But that, that doesn't mean that the Prophet is also not going to make uh, plans to secure the future of the community in the event that a sizable number of his followers are killed. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. And if, if you have more time, just uh, one, one last question. Sure, one last question. And, and this is, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about Uthman ibn uh, Mazun? So Uthman ibn Mazun, 
off, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't have any biographical information to share. I'll, but I'll look it up, inshallah. I don't know details, but we do know that he was very dear to uh, to Amir al Mu'minin. He was a devout companion of the Prophet. He was loyal to the Ahlul Bayt. But off the top of my head, I don't have any any specific uh, details. But inshallah, I'll definitely uh, look into that.